All right. First task complete. Um, so thank you, uh, Pam Jean, and for all the organizers of this symposium uh, for allowing us to come together. Um, it certainly takes a lot of work. Uh, even to put on a, a symposium like this takes a lot of work on a lot of people to, to do research, especially when you're starting using lots of data. And so um, I'm just listing a, a number of the people at, at UAB as well as uh, the Southern Research Institute, which is a private, it's almost like a mini pharmaceutical company that's right next door to uh, UAB that we work with. Um, and so I am going to be talking about integrating omics uh, in the setting of glioblastoma multiforme. Um, I think I had some of my thunder stolen by the uh, first couple speakers that talked about some related things of what we're doing. And, and actually, you, you showed uh, a slide of my boss. My boss is Jim Bonner, who did that Cetuximab uh, project. So uh, it's coming full, full circle here. So um, in terms of uh, what I'd like to go over, just uh, really a background and vision of what we're trying to do in, in our model system uh, that you've heard actually a little bit about today already. Uh, then get into the omics platforms and then what we're doing with it. Um, so uh, first of all, background and vision. So I know we come from very different spectrum of background. And so just to introduce you to glioblastoma multiforme, if you're not familiar, uh, this is the, the most common primary and the most aggressive uh, primary that can uh, occur in the brain. Um, it's uh, pretty much a uniformly fatal disease. Uh, the average lifespan is about 14 months uh, for patients with this, uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons why that's the case. Um, this is just showing a, a picture of, the, of this type of tumor, and, and obviously this is not a great place to operate. Uh, you can't just say, oh, I'll cut you here and I got the tumor. Um, and so uh, that, it, it's a very highly invasive tumor, so it's really hard to, to deal with surgically. We use chemotherapy and radiation uh, to try to treat this, but uh, invariably you get uh, resistance and, and uh, some of it, it's inherent. And so uh, as a radiation oncologist, they do treat a, a good number of these patients, uh, and, and they are difficult. So the, the main uh, idea, uh, based on the, obviously the, the slides we saw before with the Human Genome Project, is there a way that we can take information from these patients and apply it in the clinic uh, for some useful information? So that's really the, the elephant in the room, so to speak. So um, getting into the genomics, in the U.S. is part of the international consortium, but in the U.S. Uh, we have the Cancer Genome Atlas, or the TCGA. So this was a, a project uh, by the NIH to, to characterize, I think, uh, I think it's now 26 tumors or maybe more now, but basically omically characterize a bunch of uh, patients' tumors and try to understand really taxonomy of the tumors and come up with subtypes and, and have information. Well, GBM was the very first uh, tumor they selected for it. And so this was the publication from 2008 where you see, um, you know, copy number variation, you see, you know, gene sequencing, transcriptomic analysis, um, microRNA, um, all sorts of different platforms that, that were used. Since then, they've kind of moved down from the genome, epigenome, down towards uh, more proteins with things like um, uh, reverse phase protein arrays, uh, but they haven't been done in all of the samples. But uh, this was kind of the first stab at it in the U.S. So I think what really came about from this uh, initial project was that this is a, a pathway-driven disease. And so you have a lot of, of signaling that happens that's aberrant in these tumors. And so... Uh, things like receptor tyrosine kinases uh, up here, you see um, you know, amplifications, mutations, and so forth. Uh, you have PI3 kinase mutations, P10 loss, all sorts of things that lead to kinase signaling. You have problems with P53 and RB, and it really tends to drive these types of tumors. Well, um, uh, kind of the, the major follow-on paper uh, to that initial one was the Varrock paper in Cancer Cell a couple years ago where they used the transcriptome to define molecular subtypes, so still taxonomy, uh, but maybe some relationship to the etiology of the tumor. Uh, they came up with molecular subtypes like uh, the proneural, which is probably a secondary GBM, meaning it came from a lower-grade tumor that transformed to a more aggressive form, a neural, a classical, and mesenchymal subtype, and they done, did that in the TCGA and then validation samples to come up with these molecular subtypes. Um, and so Really from that, I think that's kind of the, the framework for what we're doing. Uh, and so you, you basically have this taxonomy. You have different patients have different maybe biology behind it. But, but what do you do with that information? 
So really the key, I think, is finding an experimental model system that allows you to test hypotheses, test therapies. And so you've heard a little bit about that already with um, you know, these xenograft systems that are being developed, and so I'm going to go into that. But I think at a minimum, there are certain requirements that, that we need. You need to have a realistic model, one that's, that's not an artificial setting, but it, it's close as we can get to the true tumor biology, one that shows the diversity that we see in the patient population, and, and then lastly, one that you can test in, in a reasonable time frame. So, um, so let's go to uh, the models. So uh, once again, we, we've heard about this a little bit this morning, but the concept is there are a lot of different ways to study disease and get papers and grants and so forth, but is it going to make sense and matter? So the immortalized cell line is kind of this, this pathway going on the bottom. So you take a, a cell, you grow it in plastic with a bunch of serum, and you can get them to grow and proliferate um, pretty much uh, forever. Uh, the problem is, is that you, you actually make these things change. So they end up looking a lot different, potentially, than the original tumor. Well, you can implant them into animals. You can have a subcutaneous or, or basically a tumor put into a flank or hind limb of a mouse uh, that's immunocompromised, and you can grow a tumor. Or you can do it orthotopically, which is an intracranial. Or uh, orthotopic really just means putting it in the organ of origin. And so that would be brain for this one. So you can do it that way. But we tend to distinguish a separate thing called a xenoline from a xenograft, because you can take these immortalized cell lines and put them into a mouse brain, and it'll grow, but it doesn't look like the original tumor. So we use xenolines, which uh, pharmaceutical companies tend to call patient-derived xenografts. Um, in, in the U.S., they actually call them avatars. And so, um, so that's one strategy, is to, is to potentially grow this tumor. So we know, you know there are companies that have been spun off from like Hopkins and things like that, to try to generate these, um, these avatar systems for study. And so we, we think it's a good model. So um, part of the reason uh, I think that we're, we're going this way is that we've been underwhelmed, so to speak, by the failures of cell culture translating into, into the clinic. And so um, once again, uh, you have cell cultures growing high growth, high, uh, high growth media, you've got serum, you've got high oxygen, lots of sugar. So they're, they're just gr bred to grow. Whereas in reality, in a brain tumor, you've got areas of hypoxia, you've got lower glucose, you have other systems at play that, that are really much different, even opposite to what you have in the cell line. And so, um, and so we, we feel that perhaps doing work in that may, may help us out uh, in the future. So um, we believe that they're better. We want to kind of prove that. Um, and so... Uh, uh, I'm kind of introducing a term, a proband model. There are different ways of calling it, but it's this avatar system uh, to try to, um, to model patient behavior in, in a testable format. And so you can, you can characterize these xenolines, you can, you can do drug testing, and, and hopefully have, uh, have a, a better outcome in the future. So this is showing uh, kind of what we envision, uh, envision for this disease. So the, the thought is that you, you start off with a group of these avatars or, or xenolines and you characterize them very carefully. So you, you end up getting, you know, transcriptomic, genomic, kinomic profiling and just basically try to understand the biology of these xenolines. You can then go on to do drug testing, phenotype testing. You can see how they do against, you know, various therapies and so forth and then build up a response database for them. And so the concept is that when you have a patient come in off the street into the clinic, you can profile them and find their matched avatar. Um, I know that, as we've heard this morning, that there are companies that are trying to do this for an individual patient. You grow your own avatar, and you, then you have it tested and, and so forth. But based on, on that, um, nobody would ever get it for this disease. They'd be dead by the time you you know, grew up the tumor and, and tested them. So that's why we wanted to go with a proband, where you're really just finding the closest match that you have uh, good information about. And so then you take that information, you go back and, and make your patient decision. So this is what we're, what we're hoping to, to, to do. So, um, so let me get into um, the, the actual model. So uh, what this is, our, our tumors are taken directly from the operating room. So our neurosurgeons will go in and, and they'll cut out a, a tumor. Some of it goes to pathology. The rest of it goes to our brain tumor animal uh, uh, core facility. And so those are then uh, placed into athymic nude mice. So you've heard about different types of, of mice, like this NGS mouse and, and nod-skid mice that can take tumors. We, we prefer athymic nude mice for a couple of reasons. One, they're a whole lot cheaper. 
So we, we do that. And the second uh, is that a lot of these heavily affected uh, mice that can take a lot of two different tumors are very radiation sensitive. They, they have uh, basically DNA repair mechanisms that are, that are out. And so radiation would be you know, very effective against the, the, the host component. And so athymate newton mice are not radiation sensitive. And so uh, we think they're a good model. Um, within it, we have, uh, we've, we've found that us and other groups have found that the, it seems like these tumors do a better job of, of representing the original tumor. And so, um, and so we think that it's, it's a good thing going forward. Um, we, we have been developing them at UAB for quite some time. We have tumors from the Mayo Clinic, from Duke University, and Henry Ford. And we even have uh, isogenic parents. So we have had tumors that have a parent, and then they've been uh, treated with temozolomide, our main chemotherapy, and they've developed resistance. So we have kind of a resistant paired with its parent. So uh, we can hopefully look at mechanisms that way. So uh, these are the, uh, the, the cohort of, of tumor xenolines that we've, we've gone after. So you can see that they have uh, various passage numbers, so you can kind of tell which ones are newer uh, versus the others. Um, some of them uh, were untreated patients to begin with, some weren't. Um, and they have uh, varying survival times. And so that's shown graphically here. So like most GBM, the patients do very poorly, just like our mice do poor, poorly. But some actually are, are like the original tumor, relatively slow growing compared to others. So we have a nice spectrum. So we, we, once again, we think we have a good system, but do we really have it? So we wanted to prove that. And so we used um, uh, some omic technologies to see how, how it does. So these are the, the platforms that we use. So we use some of the more traditional, uh, like an Affymetrix, a whole exon um, uh, transcriptomic uh, array. We used uh, Illumina SNP chip arrays. Um, uh, Roche 454 deep sequencing for some, and then, of course, Kinomics. Um, and so we're, we're trying to integrate that together, and uh, we, we like to use the term integromics. I don't know if it's really a term, but uh, we'll use it um, to integrate all these things together. So, um, so this just shows uh, some of the public um, databases that we use for comparison, because our first step is really to just prove whether our model matters. So we have our TCGA. We have uh, subcutaneous xenolines. So these are xenolines that are only grown in the flank, not the brain, but they are at least patient-derived. And then we have uh, cell lines. So I'm going to show you that data. So um, the, the questions that we want to ask for this are, do the molecular subtypes that we see in GBM, those proneural, mesenchymal, neural, and so forth, exist in our xenolines? Um, how do the different model systems vary? Are they similar? Are they different? And then, um, you know, how, how good is the orthotopic xenoline versus the others? So this is back to that Varrock paper in cancer cell um, where they had the TCGA patient samples, the validation set, but they also had the subcutaneous xenoline. And we, we actually have some of these tumors. And uh, what you can see is that they, they had the proneural, the classical, and the mesenchymal. They did not see the neural. And probably because these are all grown in the flank of the mice. So when we have done it uh, in our orthotopic xenolines, uh, shown here on the right, we actually can recapitulate all four of the molecular subtypes. So as, as far as we know, this is the first demonstration of the neural subtype in, a, in an experimental system. And so going back to our cohort, we've got a, a kind of a nice range of molecular subtypes um, among our xenolines. So we feel like it does show the diversity uh, that's seen in the, in the tumor uh, that we see in patients. So moving on to uh, comparisons. And so um, Sean Chen Kui in our, our, um, in our group is statistic, uh, basically a statistical geneticist, and she's very interested in equivalency testing, so really seeing how things compare. So we saw uh, some this morning of uh, comparing xenografts versus the uh, original tumor to see how well they compare. And so um, a, a perfect match would be a nice diagonal this way between the, the genes uh, expressed in your primary tumor versus the xenograft. And so these are for the subcutaneous, so flank-based xenolines, so patient-derived but grown in an abnormal spot. And so what we see is that there are certain genes that start to be higher in the xenoline uh, versus the tumor and some that are actually lower in the xenoline but higher in the tumor. So we want to kind of figure out exactly what that is. And so when you start to look at uh, the molecular subtypes, your proneural, classical, and mesenchymal, what we find is that 
these genes are all related to proliferation. They're cell cycle, DNA re replication, and it makes sense. You're, you're, you are passaging them, that you're, but you're passaging them in, a, in an animal. And so we see that increase. What's notably decreased on that bottom right-hand corner are host defense, inflammatory genes. It makes sense. You're using athymic nude mice, and so they don't have T cells. So you're going to have uh, some of that uh, apparent, but overall it's, it's a pretty decent model. When we do the same type of testing with our orthotopic xenolines, I think it's even a better representation, though we still have that upper quadrant where we do see some increase, probably a passage effect or something, and, and some decrease because of those host response, but in general we think it's a, a pretty nice uh, reproduction of the human tumor. So what about the cell lines? This is what happens when you use GBM cell lines. Um, I think it's just very striking that we're seeing this major difference, especially for this disease. This is a, a highly adaptable disease, uh, a very genomically unstable, and so this is not surprising that you see this. So, yeah, you, you instigate this type of change in the cell line, and then you block it. Oh, I've cured GBM. Well, no, you didn't. You cured, cured, the, cured that cell line. Um, and so we think that this shows that our model is very good. So uh, I'll quickly go through the, the copy number variation, uh, which we use the Omnichip. And so uh, this is uh, kind of the broad spectrum view, the 10,000 foot view. Uh, I guess I should do that in meters here. So, um, but uh, the orthotopic xenolines across the genome, uh, this is their copy number variation, uh, up top for the xenolines, and this is from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And we see that just based on the heat map, you can tell it's a pretty good representation. We're seeing uh, amplification of EGFR here. We're seeing loss of P10 here, just like we see in the patients. So we think that uh, on the copy number side, it's, it's very close. Um, looking specifically uh, at gene level events, we're seeing amplifications in things like EGFR. Um, you know, we see other things like mix, things that you might expect to see. We see deletions where we expect to see them, some of the, the newer uh, identified ones like uh, QKI um, and, uh, and some interferons, P53, of course, are, are seen. So um, the, the gene set here are the ones that are considered the usual suspects for GBM, so uh, EGFR, PDGFR, P10, neurofibromatosis 1, uh, IDH1, and so we, we definitely see these events occurring in our xenolines, but I, I would say that we're seeing it probably more frequently, and so we, we are having an increased copy number of events, once again, probably related to the passage, but, but certainly superior, I think, to cell lines. Uh, we've also done the deep sequencing of uh, kind of uh, the 40 genes that are thought to be very uh, important in GBM uh, pathology. Once again, you see lots of kinases listed here. And so when we look at how they uh, show up in our, um, in our xenolines, we see certainly the mesenchymal has a, has a lot of these uh, events occurring, but um, certainly they're distributed across each subtype. So in terms of a summary at this point, um, we're, we're seeing that this xenoline, we think, is a fairly good representation of what uh, the human primary tumors look like. Um, though we do see some increased copy number events, we are seeing some increased proliferation, but for the most part, it looks like the original tumor. I mean, these tumors are highly invasive in the brains of mice. I mean, they, they look like uh, the GBMs you see in the clinic. Um, so with that, we go to the stolen slide from Pam Jean, uh, which is uh, the typical... Uh, uh, slide showing this. I obviously don't have to go through the, the specifics of it, but really just to show that uh, we think that the PAM station, which we have the PAM station 12 in our lab, um, is uh, particularly important. This disease is driven possibly by so many kinases. And so um, uh, I'm going to go into some of what we've done in terms of taxonomy and, and phenotype based uh, studies. And I'll highlight the guy sitting in the back there, um, Josh Anderson, who's uh, the director of my group. Some of you have met him today. Um, he's obviously involved a lot. And then uh, Christine Duarte is our uh, Bayesian network and biostatistician who has kind of helped us with, with analysis uh, and uh, has really worked with us a lot the last couple of years. So um, our initial work was really basically looking at the taxonomy of these xenolines and seeing, and seeing how they look uh, in terms of unsupervised uh, testing. So just looking at uh, heat maps, once again, uh, as Rob pointed out, each line refers to a, a peptide or probe on the, on the chip. And so this is for the tyrosine kinome chip. This is the serine threonine kinome chip. And so we're definitely seeing diversity here. But can we make it into a simpler format? 
So you heard about some of the PCA analysis, this partial least squares methods. Um, the, the strategy that we've used um, is to simply look for the highly variant peptides. So we have a bunch of different xenolines, different growth patterns, different molecular subtypes. Let's just hone in on those peptides that really discriminate those groups. And so by taking ones with high variance and, and disregarding the, the lower variant ones, uh, we decided to build a classifier. So you take that and then you just do hierarchical clustering. And so what we see is, is if you cut the dendrogram up here, you really get three main groups. And so we arbitrarily call them a classical-like, a proneural-like, and a mesenchymal-like um, because they, they tend to segregate well with um, the molecular subtype. But when we actually look at how all of our tumors fit in there, uh, the classical was the one that was m more promiscuous. Um, sometimes it went with the classical-like, sometimes it went with the mesenchymal-like. The proneural and the mesenchymal tend to segregate fairly well to its own molecular subtype as well as the kinomic subtype. So uh, to sum up uh, what we've done so far here is, is really the taxonomy, and I think that uh, what we're seeing is that um, you know, we have not only this genomic transcriptomic information, but now you're adding in this functional proteome, the kinomic uh, data, and we're even getting these uh, kinomic subtypes. And so this was really what we were tasked with with our first funding round for this project. We got some money from a contractor for NCI, the National Cancer Institute in the U.S., to, to really see if our xenolines matched uh, the human tumors. And so we think we accomplished that. But uh, part of our goal, uh, particularly on the kinomic side, is to do discovery. And so we think that we can accomplish that in this model as well. And that's where I think the PAM station is really going to shine. Um, and, and that's because we believe that there is a lot of kinase signaling dysregulation in this disease. And uh, because of this platform, we can detect it and we can even potentially test it doing ex vivo profiling. So, of course, I come from a very kinase-centric worldview. So although we have these genomic um, alterations that do lead um, to signaling, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of steps between the, the genome and, and, and proteins. And so we are particularly interested in how the kinase sit in with, with these uh, various factors. So uh, one way that we've decided to look at it is just looking from the kinome and then going from there. So can we identify dysregulated kinases? Uh, we use you know, knowledge bases like Metacore that I know uh, Pam Jean uses a good bit. We try to use other prediction algorithms to find um, upstream kinases that are key and then try to relate those to gene expression events because we do have a lot of gene expression data for this disease. And, and the other approach is to also start from the genome, looking for major gene alterations and seeing the repercussions from that and how the kinome fits in. And so um, we're pretty much trying to tackle it from all these different aspects. So, so one very simple way of doing it is say, let's do a supervised analysis first. So let's discriminate based on Im information we already have, like the molecular subtype. So if we simply took the proneural tumors and the non-proneural and then do a, uh, and then do uh, basically the high variance among those peptides, can we find kinase drivers that seem to distinguish proneural from the non-proneural? And so that's what we have here, where we see you know, certain probes that are very high in the non-proneural versus ones that are very high in the proneural. So right now, that's simply a link between your kinomic data and your transcriptomic data. And people you know, have done a lot of work with the transcriptome for this disease. Now we're adding in potentially targetable agents because the genes that were selected were really you know, semi-random. I mean, some of the, the genes that were used to create these molecular subtypes are, you know, maybe, they're not even drivers, they're just consequential um, from those drivers. And so uh, when you start picking out kinases, that's something we can target. And so that's why I think this type of interaction, taking, you know, kinomic data and linking it to the gene expression is very key. So, um, so the, the last, with well, the last few minutes I have here, I'm going to go through some of the phenotype uh, data and what we think is the, the power of, of developing this type of model system. So um, this is just one per particular uh, aspect. We have um, radiation sensitivity data on some of these xenolines, where these an animals have been tested with radiation. Some of them, the, the tumor grows a lot slower or dies off when you radiate them. Some doesn't do anything. Maybe radiation adds a half a day to their lifespan. And so when we want to compare the radiation sensitive versus radiation resistant, we can you know, find those substrates that really dichotomize among them map them for all of our xenolines, and then try to build network maps to, to understand um, pathways. 
So this is just showing uh, the peptides that showed up from the, the tumors that we have profiled, which this could obviously be modified as we test additional tumors. But we've already kind of built a classifier that seems to distinguish one group of tumors uh, from the other in terms of radiation sensitivity. And so going forward, we're going to test this. We're going to do the radiation testing on these animals and see if this predictor holds true or if we have to modify it. Uh, the other th nice thing about this stuff is you can map these substrates onto, um, onto knowledge bases. So, um, you know, each probe, we have 144 probes on these chips, on each, you know, PTK and the SDK chip. However, those probes are representative of multiple proteins in reality. You know, there's a high homology between them. So uh, through, uh, through help uh, with, with PAMG, we have these blast expanded substrates, so to speak. We take those substrates and we map those. And so you, you end up kind of getting a richer uh, network uh, model that way. And so we perhaps have identified some uh, resistance hubs in this disease. And incidentally, there have been, a, a, just in the last month or so, a new FGFR translocation that's been identified in GBM. So um, perhaps that could uh, equate to some radiation resistance that we see. Other strategies is to take the information we have from our xenoline. So we know how long it takes these tumors to kill the mouse, okay? So we could look on a probe-by-probe probe basis, find certain probes associate with survival. And so we have that. So here are just four of our PTK probes, um, and the survival is, is on the x-axis. And so you see certain probes that are highly phosphorylated in the fast growers and low in the slow growers. So this could be a potential target, okay? So this is one strategy. Um, we've used... Um, uh, upstream, you know, kinase algorithms to look at it. I, I know that Pam Jean is very interested in trying to identify upstream kinases from recombinant uh, data, but this is more from uh, public databases. But you know, you certain you see certain kinases start to rise at the top, like FLT1, FLT4, and, and certainly MEC uh, is is kind of a known uh, target in, in a lot of cancers. And so these could be ones that are associated with this high proliferation we're seeing in our tumors. Sometimes we see the opposite. We see increased phosphorylation is a good thing. So this substrate, you probably wouldn't want to block that one because it seems to be associated with good prognosis. And so we see it on both sides. We've seen it in the STK chip, though not quite as striking a, a correlation. But we, we certainly see these type of patterns. So we can you know, build models from that. So uh, based on what I've shown you today, I, I, I think that you know, the, the unsupervised uh, analysis and even supervised and then hierarchical unsupervised analysis are ways to kind of build information about tumor biology. And so we, we try to do that from just this basically pre-treatment specimens. But, of course, the beauty of PAM Station, uh, shamelessly stolen slide from Rob, is basically this holy grail of personalized medicine. Could you you know, test those drugs on the, on the chip and see and, and get additional information for response. And so I'll show you uh, kind of an example that we've been pursuing. So in, um, in GBM, one of the pathways that's been studied a good bit is uh, JAK STAT3 signaling. Um, and so uh, Tika Benveniste, who's uh, head of our cell biology department, um, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Brantley, uh, postdoc in our lab have been really studying this, this pathway for a, a good bit of time. And so uh, one particular drug that they were interested in is the AstraZeneca compound, a JAK2 inhibitor, that could potentially be used because we, we know that there's certainly this cascade turned on. So using her traditional um, kind of immunoblot-based biomarker studies, she said, well, let's look at the xenolines and find out which ones had high phosphostat-3 levels. And so she, they picked a handful of those and said, well, let's see how this drug works. Well, despite having exactly the same phosphostat-3 levels, they saw very divergent responses. And so you have uh, our X1046 xenoline that this little bit of you know, daily oral gavage of this drug led to a profound improvement in survival. You saw you know, basically add two to three months, to, you know, which is you know, years for a mouse. Um, versus the X1016, where the, the exact same drug was given, this is obviously a different time scale, added two or three days uh, to the average lifespan. So despite having a traditional biomarker that looked good, we saw very divergent responses. Well, what happens if we try to build a classifier from kinomic data? Well, by once again pulling out those highly variant substrates, dichotomized based on response, here we have biological replicates, so multiple mice with... Um, uh, a, a 
less sensitive or resistant tumor versus an intermediate and best responder, we saw a very different kinomic profile in the resistant one. And so, um, so based on that, you could potentially map using, once again, uh, hierarchical clustering to see how all of our xenolines go. And so just unsupervised, we're seeing that the less sensitive uh, one basically segregates very well from the most sensitive to the least sensitive. Well, we've also done that on the ex vivo. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, one thing that can also tell you is potential escape pathways that are happening. So by, by looking at the resistant one, what kinase substrates are up, we identify potential secondary targets. But we've also done the ex vivo testing, and we're seeing that once again, we're getting segregation between the sensitive and the, and the least sensitive. Um, however, what we have found is that they're not always in, uh, in congruence. And so sometimes the, the basal will predict certain xenolines to be sensitive versus resistant, whereas the ex vivo has a lot of overlap but may show some differences. And so what we're doing now is trying to take that and test that going forward to see if we can pick out what's the best strategy. Do you take ex vivo? Do you take basal? Do you take both? Do you start adding in the other omics, the genomics, the, ge the transcriptomics? And so that's really what we're trying to build right now. And so, um, you know, we have uh, this beautiful model system. We have, you know, more drugs than we know what to do with. Now we can start to test this and try to build these, these models to, to have that proban uh, system. So uh, to wrap up, I know I'm kind of right at the end of my time. Um, we, uh, you know, I kind of already highlighted this, this first part. But down here, we have a very unique situation at UAB. We have a, a brain spore, which is a specialized program of research excellence funded by the NIH. And, and basically, this grant system requires that all projects within five years have a clinical trial. So you have to have a transition from your preclinical models to clinical models. And so fortunately, we have a tremendous tumor repository. We've got blood, urine, CSF, fresh frozen, uh, you know, embedded tissue. We have tons for hundreds and hundreds of, of tumors. We're building these new xenolines every week. And so we're, we're developing these larger repertoire. We have a lot of clinical trial planning uh, and expertise in, in doing these things. We have good biostatistics and bioinformatics. Um, and, which I don't even have time to go into today, but we have, we've been developing bioinformatic resources to really connect our data with the other omics. But on top of that, we have the Southern Research Institute that we partnered with in this project that's, that has, I think they own the rights to 40,000 compounds in their compound library. They have a million compounds uh, in their uh, drug library and the robotics to do high throughput screen screening. So we almost have a pharmaceutical company adjoining us. And so we're kind of sitting in a very good position and, uh, you know, people are pretty excited about how our kinomics is, is working in this. So to final, finally summarize the, this the concept of personalized medicine uh, with the avatar system, uh, we can hopefully characterize, uh, you know, novel therapeutics with a, a very relevant system that hopefully will allow us to tailor therapy for our patients. And so with that, I'll just uh, acknowledge all the people that have been involved in this project. I'm sure there are others that, that have been involved and, and are uh, funding resources. So that's it.